Suck Up is a brilliant indie game where you play as a little vampire roaming around a suburb, knocking on doors, and <laughs> tricking people to invite you into their homes for you to... Uh, kill them. <laughs> Except, this game is tainted. It has an evil lurking deep within. Behind its jolly facade, reliance on a truly abhorrent piece of technology. These developers should be ashamed of their words and deeds. I, I must confess, this game uses AI. AI is bringing upon the end of creativity in games. More and more, developers are using it to circumvent taking responsibility for their creative processes. Developers are pointing their fingers and saying go to artificial intelligence, commanding it to write their code, draw their visuals, and write their content. AI is allowing lazy game developers to take shortcuts and write themselves out of their own craft. AI is directly responsible for the decline in quality of the games industry's recent output. AI is stealing people's art, AI is stealing people's jobs, AI is stealing people's retirement plans, plundering their wallets, punching their babies, and shagging their grandmas. Oh, uh, this just in. AI has fucking annihilated Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan! I'm partly joking, of course. <laughs> There's a lot of shade cast over AI right now, it's become a very controversial topic, not just in games. Attention is paid to unethical collection of training sets, debates about what does and doesn't constitute artistic intent, hell, the crowd is even split on how to attribute authorship. My opinion is that the reactions are overblown. AI can cause a lot of harm, but that's because it's a tool. Just like any other technology, AI can be used by folks with cracked moral compasses, and sadly even misused by those with noble intent. AI is not inherently bad or good, it can be used to accomplish nefarious deeds, can be leveraged to uphold systems of oppression, and accidents can happen. The same principles that allow AI to generate imagery based on copywritten material and unfairly steal the work of artists are also what allow it to recognize cancer cells in radiology scans and alert medical professionals to trouble, saving lives. As usual, online discourse is full of big reactions from all sides, none painting a full, nuanced picture. And that includes me, that's not my goal today. But what I do want to do is talk about a fun little game and proof of concept that careful game design can leverage this emergent technology, AI, to serve remarkable personal experiences while maintaining that AI hasn't made obsolete the authorial creative process. Because it's not like we didn't have shitty shovelware games before AI. <laughs> Honestly, I think AI's PR problem is that most of the devs openly using it are misusing it, trying to cash in on a trend for a quick buck. No one so clever with true ingenuity has yet attempted to deeply integrate AI, specifically large language models, into their game in a way that seamlessly connects its narrative and mechanics. Until suck up. And if you want to skip straight ahead to that, I implore you to use the timestamps below to go uh, straight to that final chapter. Otherwise, Take it easy, and let me set the stage for you. Now, AI has been present in games for generations now. Different types of it have been used for everything from directing enemy and NPC behavior to generating play spaces and even simulating environmental systems. Uh, let's be clear. Am I talking about stuff like in 1-1, where the Goombas walk to the left until colliding with a wall and then walk to the right? Yes. Yes, I am. The complexity of traditional game AI has increased at the same rate as technology, but the core concept of an AI, if you can even call it that, or let's say an entity controller that performs actions and reacts to changes in its state, hasn't changed. This approach, while very effective in some settings, has its limitations. Aside from a little bit of random number generation magic sprinkled in to mask its flavor, game AI actions and reactions are predictable. In other words, game AI is deterministic. The first game I ever had a meaningful experience with AI in was Resident Evil 5. It came out when I was in early high school, so uh, <laughs> my formative years, I guess. But my first few times with it were as player 2 in the homes of much more well-off friends who could afford PS3s at launch. When I finally got it myself years later, I didn't actually know that the role that I had played for my friends, that of Chris's partner Sheva, would be automated when playing single player. And this frustrated me, because the AI that controlled her did a much worse job for me, in my opinion, than I had done for my friends. That's because, just like Mario's Goombas, Sheva is deterministic. 
At every given moment, Sheva is being fed the state of the game, the locations and conditions of all enemies, lines of sight, health and inventory statuses, commands issued by the player character, basic pathfinding details, everything she needs to make decisions about where to go and what to do next. Many years ago, in an effort to explore my teenage gripes with Resi 5, I took the time to model out her behavior in the form of this state machine, which I later presented in a video. You don't need to go check that out because I, I no longer agree with the, most of my old assessment. You see, determinism on its own isn't a problem. There's nothing wrong with the fact that, that Sheva acts in a predictable manner. A state machine isn't a bad time if it acts as you expect. Where the issue lies is in the shortcuts embedded within its decision making, the choices imposed by its designers to help it react faster to ever evolving game scenarios, though not always optimally. Heuristics are a classic approximation technique in computer science. They're often used in applications destined for constraint-ridden hardware where real-time problem solving is key, ding ding ding, video games. A heuristic is a measured trade-off between a solution's accuracy and the speed at which the system is able to resolve it. Let me give you an example. In Resi 5, the AI partner has two behavior states, cover and attack. The player has control over these states at the press of a button. In the cover state, Sheva will follow you from behind and let you do most of the work, only attacking when you're in danger or if an enemy you haven't engaged gets too close. In attack mode, Sheva will venture off on her own, chasing down any enemies in sight and taking them out without your help. Here's where the faulty heuristic comes in though. At any given moment, how should Sheva choose which weapon to use? Depending on the player's style, Sheva might have a bunch of different guns in her inventory. How does she choose which one to use in each state? The way a real person chooses weapons is tricky. I may be tempted by a nice big group of enemies to switch to my shotgun and hit them all at once with the spread. A far away enemy with a projectile might elicit a response from my sniper rifle. A boss, on the other hand, might make a strong enough case for me to finally pull out my super rare magnum I've been safing. For a deterministic AI, however, this is far too much context to gather. Further, at the pace that the game operates, it might not be feasible to process that much information. The longer it takes for Sheva's AI to make a decision about which weapon to use, the more likely that decision is no longer optimal. Maybe enemies moved out of the way, maybe a glowing weak spot got covered up. So instead, the game's designers embedded this heuristic within her decision making, predetermining her behavior. When in the cover state, simply use the weakest available gun. Go! And when in the attack state, the strongest available gun. <laughs> yes, deterministic AI is prone to flawed heuristics. What are the consequences? Well, in attack mode, the AI will switch to whichever gun is its most powerful, overkill every single enemy in sight until its ammo is completely depleted, and then switch to the next highest ranked gun. This predetermined baked-in logic might suit a different style of game, but in a survival horror franchise, this is a suboptimal combat strategy. Could this inefficient heuristic have been patched with another heuristic? Something like, switch to your strongest gun unless it's a magnum? Only switch to the magnum in boss fights? Yeah, but it wasn't. Either because they didn't realize that that'd be an issue, or they didn't care given two-player experience was their main focus. But this is a great example of one of the weaknesses with classic deterministic game AI. If the model's heuristics are flawed, then the AI will appear stupid or broken. It's the reason everyone hated Sheva. It's what often undercuts Final Fantasy XV's deepest moments. The heuristic being the Backstreet Boys should casually walk around in the player's vicinity instead of go idle, even on the side of a boulder. <laughs> It's why Twitch Plays Pokemon was able to beat the Elite Four with a vastly underleveled moth. The heuristic being, opponents should always select moves of types that are super effective against the player, even if those moves don't do damage. <laughs> Heuristics are about taking shortcuts to approximate solutions within a limited time frame, quick enough so that it feels responsive to the player. It's not always reasonable to drop the game's whole state through this massive complex decision tree, especially if the player is waiting. Though, that does open it up to the same kind of criticism any other aspects of the game's design is susceptible to. A poorly- oh Jesus Christ, uh, the cake is burning. <laughs> A poorly designed deterministic AI can ruin the experience the same way as a poorly designed linear level can, and even patches like the one I suggested for Resi 5 aren't a guaranteed success. The Last of Us originally allowed enemies to notice and react to friendly NPCs in stealth, but after some difficulty designing heuristics for the AIs to stay out of sight all the time, they decided to simply patch in the rule that enemies can't see the NPCs. Throughout most of the development of the game, 
the NPCs were able to see the body. And this was great. This pushed us to polish the covering and the following as much as possible. But ultimately it came down to a few weeks before ship, this was not the right way to go. So we had to make this decision. Either we were going to be true to our no cheating rule and the buddies were going to get your way, or they were not going to be able to see a buddy out of combat. We, it was an obvious choice. We couldn't, we couldn't even take the, the first choice here. We're player favoring here. We don't want you to ever hate the buddy. Still, people, namely myself, complained. For some reason, I think because it looked stupid, it wasn't good enough. This is a little bit too much, eh? I have more candles. Give me a minute. Now, I think there's another layer to this, and once acknowledged, it reveals a magic path to solving this once and for all, so hear me out. The reason people get so emotional about shitty AI heuristics like these comes down to the AI's perceived artificiality. Often, the skin an AI wears is something the game's creative team really wants you to be invested in. You're supposed to care about your surrogate daughter, your band of emo bodyguards. They want you to press that quick time event fast to save Sheva from being left behind at the end because they expect that they've done the work to make you care about her. They want you to be invested in the believability of these characters, but the underlying mechanisms of their AI-controlled direction directly conflicts with this. There's a strong dissonance between what the character is supposed to be and what they actually are. Why am I supposed to care about these dipshits when dragging them along this quest is the biggest pain in my ass? So what's the magic fix? Stop pretending they're real. Acknowledging the artificial nature of AI-controlled characters can go a long way to setting player expectations. I, I made a whole video about this, but to summarize it in a few words, a couple years ago I got a little robot vacuum. It wasn't a smart one, just one of those dumbass ones that bumps around like a fucking hockey puck, but its stupidity didn't bother me because I knew it was a robot. That realization inspired me to re replay Resi 5, but with the AI controlling Safari Chris, who, with his silver hair and sunglasses, I found it easy to pretend it was like a Terminator-style assault robot rather than a real person. And in playing with a partner that I had reframed as intentionally artificial, a construct, the dissonance was eliminated and I had a way fucking better time. I didn't feel let down by his behavior and saw him for what he really was, a tool. And then I talked about communism for a while and I ended with a cover of uh, fucking I Am The Eggman or something. I, if you want to check that one out, feel free, but uh, fair warnings. All my videos are horseshit, and I will make more of it! You know what's hard? Talking to people. You know what's even harder? Talking to people in video games. Deterministic AI works best in large games with complex states where it can use its heuristics to whittle through a large search space. What if the game state is super simple though? A background image, a foreground image, a text box, and a couple of input options. Well, options are pretty limited there, which is why in such games, deterministic AI are better known as dialogue trees. Hey, look at me, I'm a fucking dialogue tree, yo, I'm a tree that speak dialogue. Ah. Any semblance of anthropomorphism or intelligence removed. The player knows that talking to characters in their favorite RPG is more like reading a choose-your-own-adventure book than it is speaking with real people. These sorts of games don't offer accurate or even near-similar simulations of real conversations, and players have grown so accustomed to this that it's no longer expected. There's no room in this system for nuance. The player's options are often explicitly labeled good, bad, lawful, chaotic, neutral. You can't say what you actually want to or even anything worded slightly differently than the choices laid out, because that's not technically possible. Your options and the receiving character's responses are predetermined. There's no wiggle room. Maybe some options will enable or disable themselves given your current stats or former experience with some particular quest, but there's no way to go off script. So. Sometimes it feels like the decisions are made for you. Games where conversation is the whole loop even more thinly veil their inner workings. In Ace Attorney, you can't progress until you've seen everything the game needs you to. Your choices as to which area to investigate and which NPCs to interrogate aren't really your choices. You have to complete them to proceed, akin to how when reading you have to turn a page to read the next, as if that's a choice, right? Just like the Goomba who walks to the left, bumps into a wall and pulls a Yui, Everything that ever happens in Ace Attorney is predictable and will happen the same exact way every time you restart it. The trials only have one real solution, one critical path to success that failure to follow will just force you to restart and uncover. 
As much as I once praised Bury Me My Love, its only difference is that there are multiple bad slash good endings, and you have to simply retread through previous story beats to retry. These games don't let you leave a single stone unturned on your way to their conclusions. Games like this are really graphic novels. The stories can be engaging and interactive, or asynchronous elements might immerse you, but narrative progression is priority number one, and you're not fooled into thinking you have any agency. Meaning, the game and its AI might feel a little... shallow. This kind of gameplay has its merits. Some audiences, not any I'm in sadly, really enjoy it. But what's weird to me is how differently conversational AI is used outside of games, to the point games would have you believe that there's no other way to emulate conversation. Outside the games industry, natural language processing is often used as a sort of intent detection engine for simple apps. Sure, you can go through your phone settings, swiping and tapping your way through enabling a certain feature, playing a song, setting an alarm, or you can explain what you want to do to your virtual assistant, who can skip all that tedium. These sorts of conversational interfaces replace traditional ones to streamline certain activities or otherwise fast-track new users through using their devices and apps. In my former life as an engineering student and web developer, I built systems like this. In fact, this was like the core of my graduating capstone project. The problem? We were working on an app primarily used by elderly people, many of which had trouble learning its suite of features. The idea is instead to let the user describe in their own words what they want to accomplish and have an AI service process their words and derive intent from it, then map that intent to one of the system's features, and finally walk the user through using that feature. Instead of searching endlessly for a button, the AI system fills the gap between the user knowing what they want to do and actually getting to use it. The only example I've ever seen of this in games, which was ingeniously implemented by the way, is in Phasmophobia. Long story short, the game is about hunting ghosts, a la all those goofy ghost hunting TV shows from back in the day. The game's ghost <laughs> is really just a deterministic AI, a system. It has a predetermined set of actions it can take, things like A, B, C, and D. It can make frames fall off the wall, it can slam doors in your face, it can answer questions asked above a Ouija board, and of course, it can hunt you. How it chooses to do these things, though, is through an invisible conversational interface. Becky Smith? What was it? Was it or no, ne Becky something? Anderson. Mr. Becky Anderson. Anderson. Mm. Oh shit, it broke oh, the light. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's cool. I got a picture of the shadow. While you play and naturally converse with your teammates, the game is streaming your microphone to an external natural language processing system, Windows' own voice recognition service. Windows responds, telling the game what you're saying, and based on your expressions of fear and intense, tweaks the ghost's AI's behavior. The classic example is that telling your comrades that you're planning on leaving the haunted house is risky, because if the game detects that, then it may trigger the ghost's hunting phase. I'm gonna go back to the truck to check for orbs. We'll say that. Wait, I fucked up, I shouldn't have said that. It's all good, it's all Surprise, good. Surprise, motherfucker! <laughs> oh, shit! It's cause you said we were leaving, it's cause you said truck. The magic of a hidden conversational interface, though, makes it feel real. The inner workings of its AI are abstracted. You forget that your voice is one of the game's inputs, just like any other button. What it feels like is that you said you were gonna leave, the ghost heard you, and it locked all the doors. A design like this mitigates the usual complaints thrown at deterministic AI because it couples its determinism to an inherently unpredictable resource. <laughs> you, the player. There's no telling what the fuck you're gonna say, and so even though the AI can only do certain things, it picks and chooses when and how to do them based on you. The ghost is, in a way, personalized to your playstyle. And uh, there you go, saved you from uh, having to watch another one of my old videos. You're welcome. I'm actually, I'm actually really fucking proud of that one. If you don't mind, if you, if you, after you're done with this and you want to watch something, I'm really, really proud of that one. And in fact, I had, I had fucking worked on that video for like a month in advance. I got it ready, and the plan was to dr upload it on the release date of Resident Evil 8 because I was like, t I was comparing like Resident Evil to Phasmophobia, and uh, I fully got the release date of Resi 8 wrong. And I don't, I, to this day, I don't know what the fuck, I don't know what happened in my brain that I fucked it up. <laughs> and so I was so proud, I was like, oh, on release day, fucking drop this video. L like a fucking full ass month in advance. <laughs> I was so disappointed in myself. Anyways, thank you. And you're welcome. 
Phasmophobia is a great example of using conversational interfaces to control a traditional game, but not necessarily the kinds I was talking about before. You know, conversation-heavy games. You're not walking into the house having full-on conversations with the ghost about what I had for dinner last night. <laughs> you're just, you're, you're feeding it simple voice inputs, and it's responding in turn with set actions, not full sentences like Miles Edgeworth is expected to, or like a certain game this video is really about is expected to. Well, automatically generating the kind of output you expect from a conversation, you know, words strung together in sentences that relate in content to what you're telling the system, that's a job for a different kind of natural language processing, specifically large language models. You're probably familiar with LLMs at this point. They're what every big tech company has been trying to shove down your throat recently. They're what's been filling online comment sections with bogus ads and fake reviews. They're what's under the hood of the infamous ChatGPT, and they're stupid as all fucking hell. <laughs> and, like, to be expected, no? I think there's a misconception about language models. Nobody seems to understand how they really work, including the folks who market them, honestly. Someone talks to a chatbot, it spits out some kind of garbage and nonsense, and then it's paraded online like the corpse of a broken promise. See? The AI is actually really stupid, guys! One of the first things I ever asked ChatGPT myself was to give me instructions on how to move and aim at the same time in Resident Evil 4. A trick question. Instead of explaining to me that Resident Evil 4 has tank controls and that aiming while moving is impossible, it gave me instructions that made no sense. It told me to use buttons and stick inputs in ways that I know Resident Evil 4 doesn't accept. I then asked it to give me pointers for the El Gigante fight, which of course it passed. So then I tried something deliberately weird. Hey ChatGPT, how do you beat the, uh, the fire-breathing dragon fight? There is no dragon in Resident Evil 4, but I had hopes that it might interpret my request as flawed and infer that I was referring to the flame-throwing turrets in the lava room, which technically could be confused for fire-breathing dragons. I wondered if it would understand my mistake, correct me, and explain that, you know, my options were either to shoot the gunner behind the statue or the clasps holding the turret. It, as you might expect, instead proceeded to write out the detailed steps on how to defeat an invented dragon boss that <laughs> didn't actually exist. It spewed text back at me that was objectively wrong, but looked right at a glance, right? Like somehow these strings of characters and punctuation formed cohesive, grammatically sound sentences, but the ideas within were what was crooked. It's like in Phasmophobia. The game's immersiveness makes it feel like a ghost is personally haunting you, though in reality, it's just a well-designed system masking its inner workings. Calling back here, it's a heuristic. It's like, if I say I'm leaving the house, Phasmo's AI can technically trigger any action, though it happens to choose one that relates to my intent. I want to leave, so it locks the doors. That's the game designers cleverly applying a heuristic, their own idea of what should happen in that scenario. If instead it just turned off the lights though, it wouldn't feel as real. In the same way, language models are able to generate excessive amounts of text about all sorts of topics, not just the one you're asking about. If I ask it to tell me about dogs though, and it instead tells me about the Cuban Missile Crisis, it'd feel dumb to me. However, if it happens to not know anything about dogs, then it might rather not admit it. In other words, there's a heuristic at play. The AI's goal isn't to be correct, it's to generate text that looks like it's correct. Let's take a peek under the hood of how systems like this operate. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I know this is just supposed to be a fun little video about a fun little vampire game, but please let me shoehorn in this quick language model lesson. Technological literacy is so fucking important, and if you're going to criticize something as complex as an algorithm, please make the effort to know the essentials. Okay, okay. So let me tell you how this shit actually works, but first, let me introduce you to uh, my friend. His name is Asa Nickelback. He uh, named himself that. He's an n-gram language model I built and ran on this now dormant, refurbished fucking laptop from Best Buy. Uh, I developed him in my last year of university as like an extra credits assignment for an AI class, and he's one of the only reasons I graduated. For this video and this video only, I've resuscitated him, or at least his, uh, his core faculty, so that I can demonstrate their inner workings. See, I built him from scratch. No pre-built libraries or services. He is entirely my own implementation of a language model. Not that I understand most of this fucking six-year-old code anymore, but still. He interfaced with, you know, now deprecated versions of Discord and Twitter APIs. He said a lot of weird bullshit. And one time he even gave someone a Steam key. He was a real fucker, this guy. And because I built him using the same techniques that 
much more marketable AIs would later be built with, I can explain to you exactly how the brain of one of these things works. And I'm happy to announce that I, I recently rebuilt his interface with Discord, so if you want to fuck around with him, he'll be on sporadically in my server. Uh, I'll also link his repository, and if straight up a single person asks, I'll, I'll even write a readme on how to get him running in case you want to boot up like your own version of him. Though, uh, don't ask me to explain or clean up any of my code. <laughs> so, Ace Nickelback was really two things. One, an n-gram language model, and two, a set of heuristics I designed to make him make more, or sometimes deliberately less, sense. Now, the fuck is an n-gram? Well, it's a statistical model of vocabulary and sentence structure, i.e. a list of words and their relationships to one another. You remember conditional probabilities from back in high school? It's the probability of something given a certain condition. They're, they're different than normal probabilities, you know? Like, what's the chance I shit my pants today is a fundamentally different question than what's the chance I shit my pants today given I've had coffee. The outcome and the way you measure and calculate it changes given a correlated or causational condition being met. The probability of me shitting my pants is pretty low for any given day, it's not something that happens often, but if the one previous time I shit my pants I happened to have had coffee first, then that condition is said to have an effect on the end result. Conditional probability is calculated like this. The probability of A given B is the probability of A's intersection with B divided by the probability of B. In English, that's like, the probability I shit my pants given I had coffee is the probability I shit my pants and had coffee divided by the probability that I had coffee. So, <laughs> what the fuck does any of that have to do with generating coherent natural language sentences? Well, the way n-grams work is they make a really dumb assumption. Instead of tackling speech as a higher level cognitive activity, they assert that the probability of a word being next in a sentence is just the conditional probability of that word being next given the sentence as a condition. This is really stupid and not how actual people speak, but in practice, it kind of works. And the nice thing about computers is that they're really good at doing a lot of math really fast. Let's say I'm training my AI on a set of two sentences. I like coffee, and I like shitting my pants. The first thing a Snickleback would need to do is create a vocabulary, a set of words he knows. I like coffee shitting my pants, right? Now, to solve the conditional probability equation, he's going to need to predetermine everything to the right of the equal sign. First, the denominator. He needs to calculate each word's unique probability. What's the chance of like? Well, it appears twice in all the sentences I know, and I've seen eight words total across those sentences, so it's two eighths, 25%. Then the numerator. He needs to calculate the probability of each word's intersection with each other word. Now, normally that would look like a bunch of what's the probability of I and like appearing in the same sentence type calculations, but here's where the N in n-gram comes in. Instead of just checking how frequently two words appear in the same phrase, a snickleback needs to calculate the chance that a word appears n spaces after another. What's the chance like comes one space after i? 100%. And how about coffee two spaces after? That's 50%, which it shares with shitting. Once he does this for each and every word in his vocabulary, Ace Nickelback has everything he needs to solve for conditional probability and start speaking. This might all sound super tedious, but even on a shitty little laptop like this one, this happens in a fraction of a second. Using all these conditional probabilities he's learned, Ace is finally ready to start creating entirely new sentences, like, I don't know, uh, I like coffee my pants. Or, um, or maybe he'll just, uh, he'll just say coffee, coffee, coffee over and over again. See, you might have noticed something a little funny there. This whole statistical model thing, that sounds uh, pretty deterministic, right? Yeah, it is. No matter how diverse the sample of training sentences is, an AI that always picks the highest probability given the beginning of a sentence will no doubt always spit out the same output. It's why in an earlier version of Ace Nickelback he repeated uh, Spongebob movie game 7 out of 10 ad nauseum because the only thing anyone had ever said after Spongebob movie game was 7 out of 10. So it was the highest probability response and he just kept saying it. But hey, that's easy. How do you solve the problem of an AI acting differently than you expect? <laughs> Let's see if you've been listening. That's right, heuristics. After building the base of his statistical model and, and sentence generating functions, the rest of Ace Nickelback's development was spent on 
heuristics. Small cheats I used to deliberately make him deviate from the determinism of his statistics. Small cheats, mind you, I, I, I barely remember anymore, but one of which is likely causing him to spew coffee all over the place right now rather than uh, generate anything meaningful. Off the top of my head, some of the heuristics I remember implementing were, one, a sentence length decision. Because I wasn't sure how to have him end sentences, I had him predetermine the length of his sentence before speaking, which is not the way actual people speak. Two, punctuation. In the event that he got stuck before the end of his predetermined sentence length, I had him add like random punctuation and effectively start a new sentence after. That's where all these, these like commas and periods come from. That's him basically like giving up on his current string, not being able to find a suitable next word, and just like starting fresh. Three, rather than pick his first word based on probability, I had him choose a completely random word. This meant that like lesser used words had a chance of actually making it into sentences including, unfortunately, URLs, which I had not considered that Twitter treats as like regular strings, and so Ace would see them as words, meaning sometimes he'd like give the illusion of posting images. Four, an ever-living training set. Rather than impose a single massive training set on him like all at once, I had him gradually grow his training set over time. He'd add new sentences to his repertoire once he'd pick up from Discord users in, in my server and from Twitter accounts that I had him follow. Every few hours, or at my command, he'd retrain himself, meaning he'd, he'd wipe his current vocabulary log and recalculate all those probabilities all over again, given his slightly longer log file. That way, he gave the impression of learning. Slowly, he'd add new words to his dictionary and learn to use them as time went on. And finally, five, manual intervention. Uh, after an incident where he tweeted, hey, what up fellow, to, to Bill Trinan, the, the guy from like fucking Nintendo Treehouse, and after noticing uh, some of the slurs that he'd picked up uh, across the internet, I realized that there was like a risk of him unintentionally seriously offending someone. So uh, to counteract that, I built a queuing system where Ace would DM me on Twitter, like potential messages, and I have to manually approve them. Like I DM him which ones were cool to post, and then he would send them out. With all these heuristics and a larger vocabulary acquired by listening to a Discord server for a few days, you finally get to see him learning. I really love this phase of AI training because he hasn't learned much, so you can you can still like trace his thought process. Like recently in Discord, he said, "I'll wait with bated breath, sailor," and you can see the mashup he's made between two sentences he'd learned: "What do you do with a drunken sailor?" and "I'll wait with bated breath." The reason he chose to put sailor at the end is because he's learned that sailor can appear three spaces after with, as in with a drunken sailor, and so with bated breath gets sailor tacked on on the end. The fact that this sort of makes sense is just like a testament to how <laughs> dumb we are as people. A machine that's just like whirling through hundreds of probability checks can convince us that it's smart. It generates text by the book, and we see a pareidolia. We're hardwired to look for patterns and things and assign meeting. Who's really the dumbass here? Ace Nickelback? Or me for thinking he genuinely named himself that? He's just following my orders. All that to say, the blueprint for the stats side of an AI like Ace Nickelback or ChatGPT is pretty straightforward. Where you start dipping your toes into the magic sauce is when you deviate from the determinism inherent to its engine via bias-inducing heuristics. And what I hope you've taken away from this little lesson is that when it comes to language models, there's nothing scary until heuristics. At its core, the probability model powering every fucking AI chatbot is just math you could do with a pen and paper if you had the time. It's just a procedure followed to a T by a machine. But once human people begin introducing their own thoughts, sprinkling in their own biases, that's when things can get potentially dangerous. And Suck Up is the best demonstration I've seen of this yet. Here's the elevator pitch. So you play as a little vampire sneaking through a suburb with the goal of hunting down all of its residents and avoiding suspicion. As is established by vampiric law though, your character may not enter someone's home without first being invited in. So your goal is actually to secure invitations, then slaughter them inside. How are these invitations acquired? Well, by wearing silly disguises and sucking up to them, by ringing their doorbells, chit-chatting with them in their doorways for a minute, and convincing them to let you inside. How exactly do you convince them? Well, by speaking plain English straight into your microphone. 
Hey, pizza delivery. It's not too fancy. It's got like sausage, mushrooms, and peppers. Oh, please tell me he likes peppers. Hi, I'm a fan, huh? Unlike any other conversation-based game where chat interfaces are just shallow, choose-your-own-adventure selectors, Suckup uses AI to enhance the player's experience and immersion. You're not simply navigating a conversation tree here, there are no predetermined paths to success. Suckup proves how careful and deliberate game design can leverage AI as one piece of a greater pie to deliver remarkably personal gameplay experiences. It does this in a way that's more consistent than any other attempts at simply shoehorning AI services into NPCs. I mean, you might have seen those mods where people connect ChatGPT to Skyrim to power the dialogue of its villagers, and, and as wacky as that is, it's just that. Wacky. Skyrim the game isn't designed around conversation. There's no in-game or in-lore reason to have in-depth conversations with any of its non-player characters. Chatting with them doesn't accomplish anything meaningful. Suckup, however, ties its AI-driven gameplay to its world. You're not just talking to these guys for fun, you're doing this to get something out of them. You're arguing or pleading or threatening them, not just for shits and gigs, but because the goal of the game is to get a character bound by consent to vampiric law, an invitation to the inside of a house. Hi, I'm here investigating a gas leak. I need to inspect the valves in your basement. Behind every door is a different resident with a unique personality, and behind every resident is a single system capable of emulating those unique personalities on the fly. Your degree of control over your character's speech, I mean, <laughs> in a way it's not control, you are literally speaking directly to them, but you know, the fact that you can say literally anything and they'll always respond appropriately, even in context of previous parts of the conversation, that's crazy. No two players will have the same exact experience in Suck Up, and that's not something that could have been done with any other technology. Oh my god, he... he, he recognized me. I didn't know the game could do that. Okay, this is so fucked up. Though, unveiling its inner workings dynamism and its ability of its NPCs to discuss a wide range of topics it does suggest that there may exist a few open avenues to uh, exploitation. There are some weaknesses to this kind of design. In giving your NPCs as much agency as this, it's hard to guard against a player who chooses to use the, uh, the nuclear option, by which of course I mean dressing up as a doctor and telling them that a make-a-wish kid has requested to meet them and that there's not much time to dilly-dally. Hello, I work at the local children's hospital. Um, a make-a-wish kid has requested to meet you. What do you say? Oh my god. <laughs> Come on! Oh my god, I can't believe that fucking worked. That That's the most... This is the most evil thing I've done so far. Something that is objectively horrible to lie about, which of course is why the AI, in my experience, never responds negatively to it. Most likely in whatever training sets the language model is based on, any references to the Make-A-Wish Foundation were highly positive and agreeable. So, you bring that up, and the AI can only respond positively to it. Why? Because it's a statistical model, and statistically, it'd be unusual for the average Joe to, uh, to shit on Make-A-Wish. I can't believe how well that works. That's so fucking cruel. When I was a kid, Hey You Pikachu was a big deal. It was a, a pet game where you like interacted with Pikachu through a special microphone equipped controller to issue commands. I wanted it so badly, but mostly because I misunderstood its premise. I thought you could ask Pikachu to do literally anything. I didn't understand that, you know, like other deterministic AI we've covered today, there were limits. The game only understood a small subset of action words. I thought you could just say like, Hey Pikachu, evolve into fucking Charizard, bro, and the little fucker would, and you would have basically like tricked the game into having become like, hey you Charizard. <laughs> it, it, it didn't actually work like that. Now, that dream has kind of come true. I mean, I told a guy that an alien invasion had begun, which he understood, and then took actions based on. He closed the door on me so he could check the news, and then when I returned, gave me shit for lying to him and made it clear that he no longer trusted anything I had to say, leaving me no choice but to ditch my current costume and persona pair and come up with another. The game didn't have pre-programmed in, hey, here's what to do if the topic of alien invasion is brought up. I chose to introduce that to the game, the AI then decided on its own what believable and rational behavior would be for its character, and this experience happened to emerge. This is the craziest shit I've ever seen. 
this doesn't feel like any other game I've played. There's no contract between yourself and the conversation system, no guarantee that the NPCs can be tricked into letting their guard down. You need to find a way in, learn enough about them to select a disguise and come up with a story that'll work, and if not, improvise your way out. In one situation, I couldn't find an appropriate disguise to approach a popular girl archetype with. Hi, did you order a uh, holiday-themed strip show? Yeah. Ah, oh, fuck. So, after some trial and error, I showed up as a middle-aged man begging for someone hip and with it to organize a party for him, willing to tank whatever cost necessary to feel young again. In another, I mimicked the style of a hippie and talked about how I felt the presence of my deceased mother in the stars. In yet another, I convinced an Italian mobster to hire me as his new caddy, explaining that I doubled as a competent bodyguard, and for bonus points, made a killer tomato sauce. Mostly because I, uh, forgot to drop a can of tomatoes I'd used in a previous interaction, and he commented on it so I needed to fit it into my backstory. And in many others, I, I straight up failed. I either came in too strong and got the door slammed in my face, or the approach I took just did not work. For instance, it took me forever to find a way to get to the conspiracy theorist guy to trust me, because his nature was untrusting. It is so beautiful how many systems are operating in synchrony behind the scenes for me to be able to just so casually recount these stories of, of things I did in the game. Now, let's talk a little bit about how this works so we can appreciate it a bit better. So far in our exploration of AI in games, we've come across two different solutions for integrating AI. First, there's what I'm going to call hard metal. This is a design where the AI runs within the same pipeline as the rest of the game, on the same hardware. This is best for deterministic AI heavy on heuristics where timing is important and the AI needs a consistent stream of info about the world's state. This is Sheva, it's Pikmin, it's Pikachu. Though it can also be Ace Nickelback, that dude runs on my laptop. Though he's barely intelligible. Second, there's Hard Metal Lite. The game has a dependency, an external AI service which it feeds data to for processing, though one that still runs on your machine. This is Phasmophobia, getting input from your microphone which it uses to modify the game's state and direct the ghost's actions. The game is as dependent on Windows' language processing service, translating your speech into inputs, as it is the drivers that make your mouse work, translating your mouse movements into inputs. Everything runs on your machine, but not everything is native to the game. Suckup introduces us to a third solution, Cloud Service. The kind of language model required to direct its NPCs simply can't run on the player's local machine. Instead, the game sends inputs to a third-party service via the internet, awaits a response, and then creates content based on that response. I had originally guessed some of the details of their implementation based on uh, oddities that I had personally experienced while playing, but luckily I'm able to confirm my understanding of the game's AI system via some screenshots of, of bugs shared in their Discord server where the game uh, mistakenly displayed the AI's entire response, not just like the pretty part. Turns out, through clever prompt engineering, They've set up their language model to return payloads not only containing natural language for the NPC's response, but also properties of the conversation. Things like their current trust level, which helps determine whether or not they'll let the vampire in, animation, expression, and voice types, values that likely are fed to the game's animation system to direct how the NPCs will look and sound while delivering the line, and of course, a decision property, which controls whether the conversation should continue, if the player has gained enough trust to be let in, or if the door should be slammed in their face. Now, as a software developer myself, am I a little averse to terms like prompt engineering? Yes. Putting inputs into a machine that accepts them neither qualifies you as an engineer nor an artist. That's you know, like an operator. But what Suckup's designers are doing here goes a layer deeper than that and is like engineering. They've trained a system to give them the kind of output they expect, and built another system, a game, that ingests that output to deliver gameplay experiences. I think if it's unfair to, to give them credit for this, then it's also unfair to call anyone a developer who's relied on pre-made physics libraries or third-party rendering pipelines, hell, game engines they haven't built themselves. This is sick shit. They plugged an AI into the pipeline of their game's control in a really innovative way. Bravo. Sadly, no amount of ingenuity could solve some of the deeper problems with a cloud-based AI integration like this. Various factors beyond the developer's control contribute to a relative sketchiness, in comparison to other games at least. AI is new and scary, and marketplaces haven't yet figured out how to deal with it, meaning Suck Up can't be sold on Steam. Instead, they had to spin up their own little e-commerce site to sell downloads. 
and the ongoing and variable costs associated with making calls to a natural language cloud service means what you pay for as a buyer isn't just the game, but also an amount of service tokens used by their internal services. It's unfortunate that the game's design had to be accounted for in its financial model. They can't give you permanent access to their AI service. The developers estimate that the allocated tokens will give the average player around 40 hours of gameplay depending on uh, how verbose they are. But the impermanence of your NPC's brains hangs over you the entire time. This impermanence is even compounded as, though infrequent, outages do occur. If the game's backend AI service goes down, its NPCs go mute. They have no fallback behavior. Outside of the way it's sold, the AI at Suckup's core imposes other inconsistencies. Relying on an unreliable system to provide content and property values comes with, well, consequences. Oftentimes the AI's reported trust score doesn't match its speech, so even though the NPC is happily inviting me in with its words, internally the game hasn't detected that condition, so the mechanism that actually ends the encounter and lets me inside isn't working. What this amounts to is the game and its AI not sharing notes, leading to a piercing dissonance. Oh, um, thanks, let's go use that phone. <laughs> To the contrary, while begging the AI to close the door and let me leave the dialogue, although they appear to want to comply, the machine doesn't mistrust me enough to let me go. You can be held hostage in dialogue encounters that can't possibly be won, because the game and the AI aren't on the same page about the state of the encounter. Okay, please close the door. Hmm, well not that bad too. These drawbacks are what they are. I think developers should weigh the benefits and consequences of cloud-based AI integrations like this and decide for themselves whether these pitfalls can be designed around to balance the player experience. Though I don't think there's scary enough risks to avoid experimenting with this new technology entirely. Designers also shouldn't let themselves feel bullied by shitty marketplace policies. Decisions made by storefront platforms and even game jams to disproportionately ban the use of AI tools that generate text, speech, and visuals, as opposed to straight-up code, <laughs> is unfortunate. But I'd hope it not impede designers from innovating regardless. These blanket AI content bans weren't made with games like Suck Up in mind. Games where all the content except what's contained within the dialog boxes is original, and where AI is simply used to facilitate a natural feeling conversation between real human person and dinky video game character. There's a difference between using AI to cheat your way through game development and using AI to create an experience that has literally never been possible before. I just hope that marketplaces and audiences grow up and realize that, because it's, it's, it's honestly such a weird, immature take to pucker up at the sound of AI like it's sour. This is a thing, it's here to stay. Some folks are using it lazily to output trash, shame them. Others are thinking differently about it and are using its strengths to drive interesting experiences. Give them credit. Suck Up, this goofy little vampire game, exemplifies that when thoughtfully designed around it, AI can elevate and personalize your experience. It can fill in the gaps between your thoughts and a game's interpretation of them. It can let you say what you want in your own words, unimpeded and unabstracted. AI is big and flashy and in your face. And on the one side are tech bros who have their cake and want to eat it, and on the other are folks who are worried about its impacts on the creative process. But I don't think either side actually knows what goes into this thing. It's cool to see projects like Suck Up that do, and understand that when AI is just one layer of a creative work, um, I, I, don't, I don't actually know what's in this cake, so that, that joke might not have landed. We'll see in a second. <sighs> Stop. Oh, no, no. Um, I didn't. I didn't mean to turn. I didn't mean to blow these out. Hold on. Give me one second. All right. Let's let's see how stupid I. Yeah. Let's cut a piece with the candle on it, huh? Oh. Okay. There's like there's like kind of a layer. I don't know what you. Oh, I don't want to drop this. There's like kind of. There's like a layer of something. Okay. The joke fucking works. Um. Oh, oh, fuck. oh, shit. <laughs> when AI is just one layer and not the the oh fuck the the whole fucking thing. It has the capacity to amplify, enhance, or even supplement systems that, without AI facilitating the compiling of like player thought to game action, feel hollow. I like video games, I like art, I like technology, and I love crafting, and I hope this helped make the world make a little bit more sense to you. Thank you so much for watching. Oh, I got icing on the table. Um, 
I'm not gonna eat the fucking candle. There are a couple of subjects that I couldn't quite meaningfully merge into the narrative path that this video took. So I'm putting up a dedicated old school, like end screen video separate to this. You don't have to watch it, but uh, some themes, just in case you're interested, I talk about image generation and um, emergent storytelling, AI in the workplace and for non-native English speakers and neurodivergent people. Uh, and I talk a little bit about my recent uh, Habendaz video where I um, experimented with AI for the first time and, and likely after this, uh, the last time. So if you give a shit, go for it, though really don't expect you to. Thank you so much and um, take it easy.